Hi, welcome everyone to the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law weekly seminar series. The past 40 of these have been in my basement gloriously. We are no longer there. We're in a real room. I could not be more excited. So today we will have, and for the fall, we'll have many talks by our pre- and postdoctoral fellows here at CDDRL, beginning with Nick Kuypers, Kuypers? Kuypers. Kuypers, <laughs> who is a PhD candidate at Berkeley in the, school, in the Department of Political Science. He studies comparative politics with a regional focus on Southeast Asia. And next year, he will be beginning a job as an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at National University, Singapore. Uh, just some quick notes about the talk for both our in-person audience as well as Zoom. Um, the talk will go from 11.30 to 12.45 or so, about 30 to 35 minute talk, followed by Q&A. Everyone in the room can ask questions for Q&A, but we will also be taking questions on Zoom using the Q&A box that you're all so familiar with. And finally, for the people in the room, please keep your masks on unless you are actively eating and drinking. Um, we have been told explicitly that we can't really be having a full lunch while we are convened in person, but if you are about to die of dehydration, please do take a sip of water. And without further ado, Nick. <clears throat> Thanks, Dee Dee. Uh, as Dee Dee mentioned, my name is Nick Kuypers. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, and also very happily newly a pre-doctoral scholar at the CDBRL for the year. Um, and today, we'll be presenting a talk, um, which is titled, this is not working. Oh, wait, it's not um, So maybe. You need to unshare the screen to then. Yeah, there we go. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'll be presenting a talk titled Failing the Test State Building, Nation Building, and Civil Service Recruitment. Um, and I'm going to talk about civil service examinations in Indonesia, and in particular, what happens to people's political attitudes when they fail those tests. I want to start my talk today with some events that occurred about a year ago in eastern Indonesia. And in this photograph, you can see about 100 individuals pictured in the courtyard of the local branch of the Civil Service Agency in Kabupaten Kerom. Um, and they'd assembled because of the results of the new computerized civil service examination. They were frustrated with the results. They had failed the test, and they were frustrated that they hadn't received a job. But they had another grievance that day. They were frustrated that this new system, they claimed, was making it possible for privileged outsiders to come to their district and take the test in places where they believed the competition would be less stiff. Now, the protests that day, unfortunately, spiraled out of control and the local branch of the Civil Service Agency was burned down. I wanna emphasize that this event was not isolated over that same time period. So here's another larger protest in an adjacent district, um, as well as one here in Kabupaten Mapi uh, on the other side of the island, right? And about a week after these events unfolded, I incidentally had the opportunity to interview the, the head of the Indonesian Civil Service Agency. And I asked him, Pat Mima, I asked him, you know, how should we think about these events? How should we think about what unfolded? And his response was really interesting. Um, and so I, I, I listed it here. He said, well, the bright kids from Java, which is in Indonesia, the most populous and, and privileged island, he said, well, the bright kids from Java apply to those areas where they will be competitive, like Kalimantan or Papua. And after two to three years, they request a transfer and they go back to Java. The question, he said, is actually how to get the Javanese to stay longer. But in Papua, the locals reject sometimes fiercely people from outside. But unfortunately, they don't have the skills to fill those roles. And so what I think is so interesting about this quote is that Papima is recognizing that there's a cost in the decision to use examinations to recruit civil servants. So there's a large literature in education and in sociology showing that success on examinations tends to reflect existing inequalities in society. And in this case, along ethnic and, and regional lines. But Pat Bima is saying, despite this, it's still worth it. Using exams will identify talented recruits, which will lead to gains in service delivery and have other presumably knock-on benefits, right? And so he's saying that, you know, despite this dynamic that is liable to provoke social conflict, it's still worth it. He'd weigh the costs and benefits and simply come down on the side of the benefits when it came to using examinations. What I can argue today is that Pat Bima's response to my question, as well as the events that I described earlier in Papua, matter because together they collectively reveal an important and I think generally understudied connection 
between state building on the one hand and, and nation building on the other. And so these things, I think in general, are thought to, to have a positive relationship, right? And so when governments engage in state building by doing things like building roads or building bridges or infrastructure, um, they're engaged in state building, but they're also engaged in, in creating the conditions that lead to the emergence of a national identity or, or national cohesion, as, as Gellner and others have argued. But I think what we see in these events um, is that in addition to building roads, one of the most important tasks of quote unquote state building is the task of hiring a competent core of bureaucrats to staff the organs of one's government. And here, it seems like efforts to recruit that competent core of bureaucrats come at the cost of efforts to build a sense of national solidarity or social cohesion across the diverse population, right? So at least in this instance, it seems like state building and nation building are at odds with one another. Now, the evidence I'll use today, excuse me, the evidence I'll use today to make this case revolves around um, data I collected in partnership with the Indonesian Civil Service Agency, in which we solicited participation in, a, in an online survey from all 3.6 million individuals who applied to the Indonesian civil service during the 2018-2019 cycle. And we received about 205,000 responses um, to this survey. Now, combining responses with the back-end database of test scores, uh, we're able to compare the attitudes of winners and losers. And I'm gonna show you today that the experience of failure on that exam meaningfully affects individuals' attitudes uh, towards the process, towards in-groups, and then towards the nation more broadly. Now, I'll give you a brief roadmap of, of the talk. I'll start sort of diving a little bit more into this argument and emphasizing the precise mechanisms by which I think it operates. And then I'll go through the, uh, the context, which is civil service examinations in Indonesia. I'll go through the procedures of how that actually works. I'll introduce the research design, which as I said, hinges on this, uh, I think unusually large scale survey and I'll go through the results. And I'll end with a discussion of some of the conclusions that I've drawn from this research, as well as some of the limitations that I think are associated with it. Um, and I'll end in particular with the discussion of some of the policy implications of the, of the findings. Now, building up the, the argument that I wanna to make today involves, I think, two key ingredients. The first ingredient, which as I mentioned, is well-documented in the education and, and sociology literature, is that success on examinations tends to reflect existing inequalities, whether along class, ethnic, or, or religious lines, right? And this is a fairly generalizable claim. Um, and I think, as I said, it's well documented, but it's worth emphasizing the precise mechanisms by which it operates, um, at least in this case. So the first is what I call biased content, which is that exam questions might reflect or often reflect knowledge held and pervaded by dominant groups, right? And so in the particular context of civil service exams in Indonesia, you know, to ground this, this mechanism, uh, in the 2018, 2019 cycle, that exam often contained questions about the Majapahit Empire, which is an ancient, Javanese kingdom. And so this is content that the ethnic Javanese are probably better positioned to answer correctly than say the ethnic Achenese uh, or the ethnic Bugis. And then on the margins, this will filter up and have consequences for, for representation. But uneven access to tutoring as well as uneven access to early education, both conspire to make individuals from marginalized, economically marginalized backgrounds less likely to be successful on the test. And when these uh, sort of economic marginalizations uh, dovetail with existing ethnic cleavages. Again, this will have those sort of representational consequences again. Now, the second ingredient uh, is that examination failure uh, prompts frustration on the part of losers, right? And I don't think this comes as a surprise to many of the educators who have dealt with students, um, but I think it happens for, for several reasons, particularly in the context of a high stakes examination that results in outright employment um, and also confers significant prestige to those who are successful. And the first reason is what I call insulted dignity. So the nature of failure uh, on a high stakes exam is I think a uniquely devastating insult. You're being judged and evaluated to possess insufficient merit, right? Um, which is a highly individualized rebuke that might in turn motivate forms of say generalized resentment or, or frustration. The second reason concerns some costs. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, preparation for these civil service exams often involves, um, you know, paying for tutoring services. It definitely involves time spent studying. And then when these things are realized have been done in vain, when you don't actually pass the exam, individuals might become frustrated, uh, yeah, with having wasted their time, which might in turn motivate this sort of generalized resentment towards those that are thought to have been successful. 
Now, the third reason concerns frustrated expectations, which is a concept with, with uh, a long history in, in the social sciences, um, and which concerns the, the sting of not having achieved one's ambitions. So in this case, if you've ideationally committed to a future in which you're an Indonesian civil servant, and that reality doesn't come to pass, it might be that you become sort of generalized, or excuse me, generally resentful and, and frustrated towards those uh, that are thought to have been successful. So taking these two ingredients together constitutes sort of the, you know, the engine of the argument that I'm, that I'm trying to make today. And I'm going to look at sort of three genres of outcomes in particular. So first, I'm going to hypothesize that failure on the civil service exam leads to an uptick in individuals' perceptions of corruption in the recruitment process itself, right? And so if you fail the exam and you're feeling upset, it might be that you come to believe the process was corrupt as a means of exculpating your own role in that, in that process, right? Failure on the civil service exam, I also expect to lead to an uptick in support for in-group preferentialism. Um, and this is particularly related to the knowledge of, of out-group success as individuals sort of seek to, to find the means of policy redress to their own individual failure on the exam. And then I also expect that failure on the civil service exam lead to a de decline in, in national identification, given that it represents the sort of symbolic core undergirding the state apparatus that's just denied these individuals employment. And given that that state apparatus is also apparently more interested in recruiting members of, of different ethnic groups or different religions. Um, and so to be clear, these are the three uh, hypotheses that I'll, that I'll test and, and ultimately try to convince you of today. That failure on the civil service exam leads to an uptick in support for in-group preferentialism, it leads to a support, an uh, increase in perceptions of corruption, and it leads to a decline uh, in national identification. Now, as I mentioned, the, the context in which I'll test these hypotheses uh, is Indonesia. Um, and I want to acknowledge up front that to many, Indonesia might seem to be an unusual place to study civil service exams uh, and perhaps the meritocracy more broadly. Um, I think a large area-specific literature has uh, argued that the allocation of government jobs is governed by patronage and, and clientelism. I think recently Ed Aspinall and Ward Berenshaw have some really good work on this topic. But what I can argue today is that, while I think that's still true for the allocation of transfers and promotions, it no longer characterizes the nature of recruitment into the Indonesian civil service, um, which I think now is basically fair and free from corruption. The reason I think that hinges on Indonesia's decision in 2018-2019 in to introduce on a national scale a computerized system of civil service examinations. And the system randomly samples questions into computer portals. Uh, exams are then uh, mechanistically graded, and applicants are sort of deterministically selected based on that, uh, on those scores. And I'm happy to talk more about this procedure during the Q&A um, and why I think it is, in fact, uh, uh, free from corruption. But just to give you a brief overview um, of how the process worked, at least in 2018, 2019, applicants search for a job on an online database, or uh, they search for a vacancy. They can apply to a job um, anywhere in the archipelago, but they can only apply to one job, one job only. Um, once they submit their application, and, and again, here I've listed the numbers of people that went through this process during the 2018, 2019 cycle. So you have 3.6 million people who submitted applications. Once they've submitted their application, their packet is sent to a centralized committee in Jakarta, the civil service agency, where it's going through what's called administrative selection. Um, this committee reviews it for completeness, ensuring they have a cover letter, a, a transcript, a three by five passport photo. Um, and conditional on, on passing this stage, they're invited to take the basic competency test, um, which is a sort of general screening exam. It's held on a computer. It takes 90 minutes. It's scored out of 500 points. And in 2018, 2019, a nationwide threshold was set at 255 points. If you're below this threshold, you're immediately notified that you failed the exam. Failed the exam. If you're above this threshold, you may have been invited to continue. And I say may because the next stage in the recruitment process is what's known as the rule of three, which stipulates the top three scoring candidates on the basic competency test uh, are invited to continue. Uh, the top three scoring candidates for any given vacancy are invited to continue to the next stage, which is the specialist exam, which is precisely what it sounds like. Um, this is an exam that's also often held on a computer. It's designed to measure the specific competencies of the, the job to which the applicant's applying. Um, so if you're applying to be a doctor in say uh, a government clinic, 
Uh, this will contain questions about medical procedures, for instance, right? The exams are then integrated. The first one weighted at 40%, the second one at 60%. Applicants are ranked in descending fashion with the top scoring candidate uh, selected for the job. Are there any questions about the procedure? Yeah, in the bag. Can people reapply the next year? Yeah, you can reapply. The only condition is that uh, you're not allowed to reapply after you're 35. So between 18 and 35, you can apply as much as you want. Yeah. So, so who is included in this? Like what kinds of jobs are they applying? What kinds of, so the greatest number of applicants are applying for jobs as teachers. Um, but it also includes applicants for what we consider the core civil service. So these are like administrators, sort of like the uh, Indian Administrative Service. Um, for instance, it also contains applicants for things like prison guards. Um, so this is the number one most desirable position in 2018, 2019. Um, so yeah, it really runs the, runs the game. And, and doctors. A few doctors, yes, for like government clinics, right? Yeah. So and, and just quickly, I, I, I knew that the passage rates are actually either even or disproportionately way or skewed towards passing, with the exception of the rule of three, where suddenly, <laughs> like the vast, I mean, the, the vast majority of people are weeded out, right? Right. Like, when we're going to sixty thousand, uh -huh. do you have any sense for sort of why like that appears to be the bottleneck and what might be driving that? You know, I don't. I mean, I think what might be going on there is that there is just on average, you know. On average, twenty applicants per position. Um, right, and that's I'm a, just curious, like, why there? Is, why is that problematic relative to us? Sort of, yeah, well, I mean, I think like what do people know about, or what do what do the candidates or applicants know about the kind of selection criteria at that particular point? So, I mean, there's not selection criteria at this particular point per se. I mean, this revolves around an absolute threshold on the test. This resolves revolves around, you know, did you actually get your documents in order? This is simply a, a competition with other people in the vacancy to which you're applying, right? And so it's a mechanistic thing. Um, so I think that's probably why there's a there's a bottom there. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Um, how can you prepare for these exams? Is that like, like do you know like what set of questions you might be asked in advance? Yeah. Um, so you can buy like a like a Kaplan style SAT prep book for it, and, and you know in the lead up to the exam, if you go to a coffee shop in Jakarta, it's just you know, everyone has one of these. Um, and but each new cycle, they prepare ten thousand new questions. So they have a team of psychometricians, which is an occupation I didn't know existed until um, this project. Um, they have a team of psychometricians that put together these questions um, anew each year, sort of like the SAT. For Carlos, and then I'm going to keep moving on. Yeah, sorry. Can there be any malfeasance in the administrative selection? Like, for example, <coughs> you're favoring your own ethnicity or something? Like, or is it all mechanical? Like, there's like a computer thing that does. So it's, it's not mechanical. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, my impression is that they're really just looking if you have a three by five passport photo. That was the number one reason that people were next at that stage. They had a four by six or something like that, right? So it's pretty mechanistic. I mean, it's not. They're not looking at the quality of the photo. I mean, they're it's just the size, right? <laughs> like, for example, like in other contexts, it might be like ethnic cues from the yeah. Context. So, like, do, do, can you observe that? Like, so, I mean, I, I can and I'll look at that afterwards in the data, um, but I haven't, I haven't looked at that yet. But I'm going to keep going out of, out of time constraints. Um, so, you know, really importantly for the theory that I want to test today, um, existing inequalities in Indonesia are very much reflected in the success and failure rates of. Uh, the civil service exam. So what you see here on the x-axis is the district level poverty rate in 2014. And then on the y-axis, you see the share of individuals who failed the basic competency test uh, in 2018. What you see is that you know, poverty rates are strongly predictive of, of failure rates. And for those of you that are familiar with the Indonesian context, the districts that are in the tails of this distribution are precisely those that we'd expect. So on the left-hand side, you see Tangadang Selatan, which is a wealthy uh, suburb of Jakarta, and there only about 17% of individuals failed the test. And then on the right-hand side, you see uh, a poor rural district uh, on the eastern periphery of Indonesia in the province of Maluku, and there about 75, 76% of individuals failed the exam, right? So turning to the, the research design, and just to remind you, the central hypothesis um, that I'm gonna try and evaluate today is that failure on the civil service exam causes important attitudinal changes, right? And as I mentioned, 
Uh, the data that I'm going to use to evaluate this hypothesis hinges on these, um, these data that I, I, I was granted access to in partnership with the Indonesian Civil Service Agency. So I was, I was given access to the backend database of applicants, which contains information on their, their demographics, their contact information, so their email address, their Instagram, their cell phone number. Um, and it also contains, very importantly, their scores um, for the 2018-2019 civil service exam. And then to collect the outcome variables that I'm interested in, we sent emails soliciting their participation in a survey to all 3.6 million individuals. And we got responses, as I said, from about 205,000. And then we're able to link these responses to the backend database of test scores, which you know, allows me to compare the attitudes of, of narrow winners and narrow losers. And I, you know, to reiterate, my expectation is that losers are gonna report higher levels of in-group preferentialism, higher perceptions of corruption, and lower levels of support for the Indonesian national identity. Um, and I think one way to go about testing this hypothesis would just be a, a simple comparison across these two groups. Um, but I think this would yield, I think, some biased estimates, the quote unquote effective failure uh, for several reasons. One is that, uh, you know, losers are probably less educated than winners. And it might be this experience, say, of education um, that, that might be driving any attitudinal separation across these groups rather than the sort of narrow experience of success versus failure. And so to work around this difficulty, um, I focus again on these narrow winners and narrow losers. So these are individuals that are within a single percentage point of an alternative disposition. And I say that they're basically comparable. They're basically exchangeable. They differ only in their experience of the test. And I have some evidence in the appendix of the paper that, that you know, I think supports this notion that they're statistically uh, indistinguishable. Um, the paper that I actually did not share, so I'm sorry. Um, and using this method, I look at several genres of, of survey outcomes. So the first is national identification, as I mentioned. Um, and this draws on some standard questions that are from the World Values Survey. I also look at support for what I call Javan preferentialism. So as I mentioned, Java is the, the most populous and privileged island in Indonesia. And these questions gauge respondents' support for the idea that the government should intervene on behalf of the Javans to, to promote their economic prospects. I also look at a more generic form of in-group preferentialism called regional preferentialism. So here I'm looking at um, support for government interventions designed to boost the economic prospects of individuals who reside in the district in which they were born. I also look at religious intolerance, which I expected uh, failure to lead to an uptick in. And I also look at perceptions of corruption, so the extent to which the process was, was fair and free from, from foul play. Now, to situate the analysis in the actual recruitment process, you'll notice that there are a number of junctures at which individuals can quote unquote fail the test. And so, you know, to be very clear, I'm focusing on the first test, so the basic competency test, right? And so I'm comparing the attitudes of individuals here in red that narrowly failed to those that are in blue that narrowly passed. And the reason that I do this is to account for some counterfactual issues that I think will become clear a little bit later on. But in some, I mean, if I focused on this final stage, for instance, between those selected and not selected, the counterfactual group of those that were selected go on to become civil servants themselves, um, which is a meaningful experience that might drive attitudes, and so it wouldn't narrowly capture that effect of failure, right? So to be clear, the analysis I'm going to show you, is, it's just a simple comparison of attitudes across these two groups. That's really all I'm, all I'm doing. <clears throat> And to give you, I think, maybe a, a little bit more graphical depiction of what's going on under the hood here. Um, so on the y-axis, you see uh, the, 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 uh, a zero-centered index measuring the extent of uh, respondent support for the Indonesian national identity. And then on the x-axis, you see applicants' uh, scores on the basic competency test. And in particular, their relative distance from having failed or having passed the test, right? And so here you see someone that's five, five points above the threshold. So this is someone that got 260 on that test, right? And the, the points that I plotted here are individuals who passed the test, right? And then what I'm gonna do is compare their attitudes to those individuals who failed the test. But as I mentioned, I'm interested in comparing the attitudes of very narrow winners and very narrow losers. So in this case, individuals who very narrowly failed the basic competency test are about 0 0.07 standard deviations less in support of the Indonesian national identity than those who passed, right? And so this is really what the research is doing. Um, and in this case, you know, this supports the, 
the hypothesis that I outlined earlier. But for ease of interpretation, I'm going to plot these effects in a coefficient plot uh, setup as I presented here. And so here you can see that 0 0.07 standard deviation drop in national identification among those who, who narrowly failed the basic COMPC test. Looking next at job and preferentialism, I find that individuals who, who narrowly failed that screening exam are about 0.12 standard deviations more in support of job and preferentialism compared to those who narrowly passed. And again, this is conditional on uh, being a resident of Java. I find no effect of failure on job and preferentialism among non jobans I think this makes sense. I mean, win or lose, if you're not a resident of Java, you're probably likely not going to support it. Um, so this runs up, I think, against floor effects. I find no effect of failure on regional preferentialism, nor do I find one on religious intolerance. I do find that individuals who narrowly failed the basic Compton test are about 0 0.08 standard deviations. Uh, more in support of the notion that there's some corruption in the recruitment process. And again, I think this is consistent with the expectation. If you're looking to exculpate your own role um, in, in that failure, it seems likely that you'll turn to an accusation of, of corruption. Now, you might say, well, some proportion of this counterfactual group of people who passed do in fact go on to become civil servants, right? As you can see here. And as I said, that's probably a meaningful experience that then changes people's attitudes as well. And so could it be that it's really that experience of um, having been selected and, and serving in, in the bureaucracy that's sort of driving this attitudinal separation, right? So to work through this possibility, I conduct another analysis in which I subset on individuals who, who, who passed the basic content test, but then a month and a half later or so, we're told that they didn't pass the rule of three, right? So I'm still comparing individuals who failed against those who passed. Um, the only difference here is that those who failed you know, sort of felt the sting in the moment of having a red screen show up telling them that they failed. And so here you see those initial estimates in gray, and I'm going to overlay these with um, new estimates in, in purple, uh, which show the analysis using this more restrictive sample. And what you see is that the results are statistically and, and substantively identical. And so I take this on balance to, to mean that the effect of failure on that basic COMPSI test uh, it is, in fact, causally significant um, in the direction that, that I expected, at least for, you know, half of these outcomes. But you might notice that the research design also, I think, quite happily offers the opportunity to study the effect of public service on attitudes, so what I was mentioning earlier. And I want to be clear, you know, this wasn't my initial intent with this research project, but I think it's a, an evident extension and one that enriches the, the results. And I also think there's been some recent work um, by Cecilia Mo at, at Berkeley, which suggests that the effect of public service might have precisely the opposite effects of failure that I described earlier, right? So you're going into diverse work environments, you're working with a lot of people. This might motivate, say, perspective taking and then have these other sort of countervailing attitudinal effects. And so the way I'll do this is, is a very similar research design to the one that I uh, showed you earlier, but I'm going to compare the attitudes of those that were narrowly offered a job against those that were narrowly not offered. Uh, a job. And so just, you know, again, graphically, this is what I'm looking at here, right? It's a comparison of attitudes across individuals at this final stage of the recruitment process. And I'm going to show you the, the effects again here in this coefficient plot setup. And so to start, what I find is that individuals that were narrowly selected for government service are about 0.13 standard deviations more in support of the Indonesian national identity than those that were not selected. So again, this is the sort of reverse effect. Individuals that were narrowly selected for government service um, from Java are about 0.25 standard deviations, less in support of Java and preferentialism, um, as opposed to those that were narrowly not selected. I find no effect of being narrowly selected for a government job on, on support for Java and preferentialism among non jobans I think this is, in, at least in my interpretation, the same thing. You know, it's running up against floor effects. I find that individuals that were narrowly selected for a government job are about 0.27 standard deviations, less in support of regional preferentialism. I find no effect on religious intolerance. And then finally, I find that individuals uh, who are selected for government jobs are about 0.42 standard deviations, less in support of the notion that there was some corruption in the recruitment process. And I think this makes sense. I mean, if you've been selected for a government job, you're not liable to admit that there was some corruption in the recruitment process. Um, although I don't think there 
Well, you might say, well, you know, the first part of this talk, you were talking about the psychic insult of failure. And now my interpretation here has been that it's really about uh, public service that's driving these results. Um, and so you might be concerned, well, could it be the case that those individuals that were, that were not selected are really driving the sort of attitudinal separation that we see? Um, and so it's an imperfect solution, but one that I, I think um, is helpful is to look at a new subset of individuals. So those that accepted the job offer, restricting it, um, or excuse me, excluding those that turned it down. So it's about 20% of individuals that turn down job offers, right? And so if we think that it's about public service, the results should still hold using this more narrow subset of individuals. And so again, here's the same uh, sort of estimates that I presented earlier. And I'm gonna overlay those again in purple. And what you see using this more restrictive subset of individuals is that the effect of accepting a job on an attitude adoption is still statistically and, and substantively uh, meaningful. Okay. So you might say, you might ask, well, you know, how should we think about these results? The first part of this presentation, uh, I was arguing that the effect of failure on the civil service exam has some perhaps deleterious effects on these outcomes that, that we care about. Um, but then the second part of the, the presentation I've been showing you um, that being selected for, for government service has perhaps some salutary effects. Um, and so to this question, I wanna emphasize that my initial intent with this research was to understand how exam outcomes affected broader attitudinal currents in Indonesian society. Um, and as I mentioned, there were 3.6 million people who applied. So that's about 2% of the Indonesian population. I um, mean, this recruitment cycle happens every year. And so there are a lot of people that go through this process, right? So I think it makes sense to talk about sort of broader attitudinal currents being affected by this process. And importantly, the number of individuals who fail is about 20 times as large as the number of people who pass, right? And so even if the effects of success or the effects of being selected for a government job are twice as large, the effect of failure on the civil service exam is, is operating on about 20 times more people. So to conclude, I think it's worth stepping back um, and, and thinking about some of the uh, sort of you know, longer history of Indonesian politics over the last 25 years. So what you see here are the VDEM scores measuring the extent of meritocratic recruitment in Indonesia since the fall of Suharto. I mean, basically what you see is a, a steady increase. Indonesia is becoming more and more meritocratic in its recruitment of civil servants. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm sure, um, you know, quite confident that this correlates with a bunch of other very positive um, things. So, so here you see GDP per capita, um, this is totally correlational, all caveats I think apply, but I think it is in fact suggestive of, of the knock-on positive effects that the meritocratic recruitment of civil servants has. Um, I think the point that I've been trying to make today is that there are also, uh, I think, trade-offs associated with this decision that frequently get swept under the rug in these conversations. So what you see here in the pink line is the number of communal violent episodes sparked over uh, civil service recruitment. Um, and this is data from the World Bank's National Violence Monitoring System. And over the same time period as Indonesia has become more and more meritocratic, there have been more and more episodes of communal violence sparked over civil service recruitment, right? Um, again, you know, totally correlational, but I think sort of broadly suggestive of this, um, what I've been trying to convince you of today. So just to, to recap, um, what, I've, what I've shown you is that failure on the Indonesian civil service exam affects individuals' perceptions of corruption leads to an uptick, leads to an increase in the extent to which individuals support in-group preferentialism, and it leads to a decline in, in national identification. Now, the interpretation that I've tried to make, at least at the beginning, as well as um, just here at the end, is that at scale, given that it's affecting so many people, these effects could be threatening a sense of, of social cohesion or national solidarity. I mean, I think particularly in a context like Indonesia, with lots of group-based inequality, this is a, a particularly important possibility. I think to, to end the presentation, um, I think a, a nice place to stop is the question of policy implications. Um, and this is a question that I, I, I care a good deal about um, and one that I've, I've had conversations with the Indonesian civil service about as a result of this research. Um, I think the question is, you know, how can we craft policies that blunt the downsides of these meritocratic institutions while well, I think still unlocking the gains that are evident um, in terms of you know, superior service delivery. Um, 
I think you know some of the levers that we've talked about with the Indonesian Civil Service Agency concern things like light touch levers. So, um, in, you know, putting in place residency requirements, so requiring that applicants um, reside in the district that they're applying for a job in for a period of at least two or three years. Um, I think a more interesting conversation is one about, say, the Indian experience with quotas or, or affirmative action. Um, I don't think Indonesia is you know, particularly at that point yet, but it's interesting to think about the trade-offs that might be associated with, with implementing that policy in the Indonesian context. Um, so I'll stop there. And I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's questions and, and, and comments. So right. thank you. Thanks. Okay, so it's really strange to try to remember what March 2020 was before all this happened. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have a question. I will keep a list. My list goes in the order that I saw your hand. We can argue about whether that's a fair thing. Let me go ahead and write some stuff down while I ask the first question, which is, um, so typically civil service reforms are implemented in countries where civil society quality is very low, uh, but it can take a lot of time before civil society jobs are considered prestigious or, um, or like good jobs. So first, uh -huh. Uh, do you have evidence that after the 2014 reforms, those jobs have been considered good jobs and have all the, in the mechanism that you outline in your theory? Um, and second of all, what are the opportunity costs of going into government versus other sectors of employment? Uh, as GDP has increased, does that mean that there are good jobs outside of the civil sector or the public sector that ought to somewhat blunt the negative effect that you're finding over time? Um, and then we will continue from there. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a great question. I think what you're identifying is one of the important scope conditions of the theory um, or of the argument, which is that, you know, I think it really only applies to cases in which the exams are truly high stakes. And that draws my attention, I think, to lower and middle income countries where there is, in general, a high wage premium on public sector work. And in Indonesia, that wage premium, using the same research design, I estimated to be about like 28%. So that's equivalent with I think other countries in that same bracket. I unfortunately don't know how that wage premium has changed over time. My guess is that it's been decreasing, but I think 28% today is still um, a fairly high wage premium that makes it a you know, very desirable job. That means when you fail, you're gonna be very frustrated. I think more interesting is how the you know, status or prestige of the civil service has changed over time. Um, and I don't have good evidence on that in an Indonesian case. Um, and I think it would be difficult to measure, um, but I, yeah, I, I can look into that. I mean, I think the important point is that the wage premium is still very much there. Um, so yeah, I, does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, we've got lots of questions. So Eric. Uh, Nick, I really enjoyed this uh, presentation. I wanna challenge you a little bit on the meritocracy issue and your speculation that uh, economic growth was a driver of uh, civil service reform. Mm -hmm. uh, and my counterfactual is during Saharto's 30 years of rule, uh, economic growth was great. Uh, and civil service reform wasn't similarly right. motivated. Yeah. So I'm wondering what's different uh, <laughs> now. And one speculative point I, I have is maybe there were micro uh, uh, successes along the way. For example, the uh, Indonesia Counter Corruption Commission uh, uh, had a very meritocratic. Uh, experiment. It was much, much smaller than the, the huge data set that you're working with. But I wonder if there were illustrative uh, examples of success that may have contributed to driving civil service reform in 2018 and 2019. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to be clear, I think that, that graph that I showed you at the end, I think my, my point there was the sort of the reverse of what you're proposing. So, I, you know, I was just sort of trying to suggest that the introduction of these reforms becomes, you know, at least it's a driver of economic growth rather than the the reverse. Um, however, thinking about why these reform, reforms took place in 2018, 2019, I think, you know, it's a great question and it's something that I, I try and address elsewhere in my, in my research. I mean, I think, you know, at least in the Indonesian context, uh, it's really a, a particular answer rather than a generalizable one. And I think it really hinges on the, um, the finance minister of Indonesia who's very reform-minded and has been in place for 10 or 15 years now. She, She's been across multiple uh, administrations and she really wanted to see civil service reform implemented. And she basically withheld fiscal transfers to the districts until they adopted this reform, which is a huge cudgel that they were basically unable to, you know, to, to fight back against. And so I think, you know, it's, 
It's not a generalizable answer to why you see civil service reform emerge at certain times and not others, but I think in the Indonesian context, that's at least how, how I interpret it. I mean, does that, does that give you a... Yeah. Um, Frank. Hi, so thanks. Uh, that was really interesting. I've actually spent time in the highlands of Indonesia and Papua, and I've seen a lot of these civil servants. I was once uh -huh. a district meeting where they had all gathered from you know, different districts in the village where I was at. Um, so there's a question really about something you said right at the end that the conclusion would seem to me are derived more from the specific nature of the Indonesian process rather than anything about meritocracy itself. I mean, I think it's bizarre if you're allowed to apply for a particular job and that you can actually choose the place that you apply to because it seems to me that's going to produce all sorts of you know regional particularistic biases as opposed to the civil service where you just apply to the civil service and they decide where you're going to be uh, you know where you're going to be so, I mean the IMS works that way right you don't yeah. you don't apply to a specific job you just get it to the IMS and then they tell you uh, where to go and so it seems to me that what you said at the end you just change the procedure to the way that you know people apply for this exam and then you will probably be able to get rid of a lot of that you know, job of preference and right the feeling that they were screwed because you know uh, they didn't get this particular job that they wanted yeah yeah, so I think, you know, there's, I guess, two responses to that. Um, I think the first is that, you know, it's not just Indonesia that has it that way. I mean, in the United States, for instance, a lot of police officers work in jurisdictions in which they don't reside. In New York, for instance, has a, has a lot. Um, and so it's not just Indonesia, but, I, but, you know, I agree with your, your point. I mean, we should just fix that problem. I think my concern is that then, not, you know, other problems will emerge. Other cleavages will get it will emerge through the examination process. So even if you restrict applications to that district, which I think will make things better, and it'll mitigate, say, the job and preferentialism effects, I think you'll still see inequalities that exist within that district filtering through the examination procedure that will then create new cleavages of resentment and frustration, right? So I think that is a generic property of exams. Um, I think if you had a you know, totally equal and uh, ethnically homogenous district, I mean, I, you know, in that counterfactual world, then I don't think you'd see those resentment. But I don't think those districts, at least in Indonesia, exist. Um, and so I think that's sort of the more generic point that I'm trying to make with the exams, is that they, they, they're sort of this machine for, for generating resentment. In order to ensure that we have all, so it seems like everyone wants to ask the question, and we're also getting questions on Zoom. So um, I'm going to group and basically just go around the room, is that all right with you, Nick? Like three questions at a time? Okay, um, so actually I also just lost track. Catherine Hahn, did anyone here have a question? Yes, all right, Catherine. So I have a bunch, and then mine are more um, confidence in the results. Um, and that is the test is what is affecting attitudes. So you said you had another paper on, on this, I think in terms of presentationally. Um, so I, I'm not, Completely convinced without knowing mm -hmm. you know, who's in the sample. I mean, ideally, <clears throat> you would have done a panel before and after. Yeah. But, you know, you, that's probably not even remotely possible. So, how do we know they didn't hold these attitudes before? How do we know that the test is, is that treatment is what caused the change? And you said they're statistically indistinguishable, but that the low fails and then right. low passes. So, give us a little more confidence on that if you could. Um, you know, where, where are they from? Like, is there, what are the differences? What's the gender breakdown here? Um, sometimes men take failure differently than mm -hmm. maybe, you know, there are, there are more men in the sample and this is bias. I don't know, yeah. I'm just throwing that up. Um, um, what's the level of education, specialization? How does it, you know, how do these things vary? Um, so I guess I'd like more information about the sample. Um, and, um, the also um, a little bit more about um, the, the percentage of jobs. Like, what does it mean to fail um, at this? Does this mean, I think you would ask this in a different way, is you can go get a job. You can't get a job, you'll be unemployed. You know, what are the stakes? How do we know that, that they would actually, this would cause the attitude um, shift um, because it's such a blow? So you, oh, sorry, no, no, that's it. Yeah. Uh, Great question. 
Yeah, this is an interesting project. Uh, when you look right at the top, and even in the discussion, it sounds like you're against exams, but I think what you're observing is just a more general problem with selection writ large, right? I mean, I remember in high school when I didn't make the soccer team, there was no exam there, but I still felt like <laughs> 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 my friends, but it's still a problem. So I wonder if maybe there's a more general argument we should make about how we have to think about how to mitigate selection issues, because we see this a lot in a lot of other places. Uh, or if, if exams just invite more people to apply, then maybe one of the solutions is that there's some other threshold criteria that they have to be performing, like, I don't know, college exam or some, or a college degree or something like that before they even show up for this. Yeah. Great question. Okay, we can stop there. Well, Brett, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, all right. So um, three quick questions, and then one of which picks up on, on Vince's point. First, I, it would be nice if you could tell us more about you know why you're so confident um, that computer results aren't somehow manipulated, or, or frankly, you know, like why people who are taking these exams, you know, shouldn't realistically think that you know maybe they're um, you, know, you should find very correlation between district poverty and you know, and, uh, and success rates or failure. But you know, I mean, like maybe district poverty, you know, indicates other measures of sort of preferentialism, right? In, in kind of public goods provision or whatever, and um, and people are, are aware of that, and so tend to think that maybe there actually isn't some kind of problem. So for, that's the first. Um, the second, and to, to my mind, this is you know, kind of a contentious point, and I think it's an important thing. Uh, you know, I would really like to know whether these attitudinal shifts are persistent. Right? I mean, like the people, you know, who you know, who do psychic feel like going to have like you know life outcomes or any be different than, than others? Um, I mean, are your effects just capturing like this kind of temporary <clears throat> break effect? And like, should we really care? Right? I mean, everyone has disappointments in life, and they usually pick themselves up and recover. And one way that you know maybe you can you can address that. Um, and this is the third point you mentioned that um, I think the the transitions that the computer based tests occurred in 2014, right? Uh, 20, 2018, 2019, it was rolled out initially in 2014, but just for right. So, but the, the, the idea is that your communal data violence, or I'm sorry, your communal violence data is in 2014, right? So, I mean, so, you know, is it, would it be possible to get data on computer communal violence um, kind of post the transition to the rollout, which might suggest that um, it, at least sort of, you know, test in kind of a more aggregate way whether that transition um, to a more democratic system, you know, actually maybe diminished um, the rate of communal violence. Yeah, should, should, should I go ahead and? Yes. Okay, um, so I'm not gonna be able to respond to, to everything, um, but I'll, I'll go in sort of reverse order. So, so Brett. Um, and I enjoyed this talk very much. Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, to your first question, you know, why aren't the results manipulated? And I think this also sort of answers questions that both Catherine and, um, sorry, I, I missed your name, um, asked. So why don't we believe that the results are manipulated? I think. You know, initially when they rolled it out in 2014, people said, well, the computer exam scores could still be manipulated. Um, and so in response, the civil service agency basically adopted this um, approach in which on the day of the exam in an adjacent room, they assemble all the test takers' families and they have, I swear to God, a scoreboard in which the exam scores are then um, updated as individuals answer each question correctly and incorrectly. There's a big red line, and the scores are moving up and down um, as you answer these questions. And so this is, I think, a fairly gladiatorial approach, but one that is, I think, uh, effective in sort of rooting out these concerns. And um, but I think that also speaks to, you know, why, you know, what are the stakes? I mean, the stakes, I think, are in fact, you know, there's this prestige, there's this public sector wage premium that we're talking about. Um, I also think there is a truly distinct sting to failure in this particular context. I mean, you're in a room with 100 individuals, your family's in the adjacent room, screens turn red or green at the end, everyone sees, um, and there's a big scoreboard with a red line on it. And if you're below it, that you know, doesn't, doesn't feel good. <laughs> um, so, so I think you know, that's sort of the, to your answer about why aren't the scores uh, manipulated. Um, are the shifts persistent? So that's one thing I should have mentioned in the talk. Um, the survey was done about a year after the exam scores were known to applicants. Um, and so, you know, I do think the shifts yeah, are, I think I yeah, so I think the shifts are in fact persistent. Um, and given that we're looking at very slight differences in an exam, you know, I think, yeah, they're, they're uh, persistent. Um, and then the question about, you know, is this a more general problem with selection 
broadly. I mean, and I think I, I make this case elsewhere in the in my broader dissertation. Um, you know, I think all selection procedures create grievances on the part of losers. And what I'm trying to emphasize here in this particular thing, in this particular project, is that it's really about the direction of those grievances. Um, and I think, say, for instance, a selection procedure such as patronage motivates different sorts of grievances on the part of those that are not selected, right? Um, I think patronage typically operates through ethnic networks. Um, and so if you're losing out on a job, at least in a decentralized setting, that means that the winner is probably someone of the same ethnic group, right? And so, you know, you're, you're developing these intra-ethnic grievances rather than inter-ethnic grievances. And so I think that's the point that I'm trying to make here with this, this exam-based selection procedure. It just has different sorts of grievances that it creates. Um, and I'll go quickly because I'm um, taking some time. So, so Catherine, your questions about, you know, is this really about the exam? Um, you know, more information about the sample. I think, and I didn't include any of the say like statistical balance tests um, in this presentation. You know, across winners and losers, looking at that very narrow threshold, I mean, across basically every demographic category except for age, they are in fact statistically indistinguishable. And so, you know, men and women have similar failure and passage rates. And, and so I think, you know, given like all, all that balance, um, I really think it is about the exam. And I also think, you know, I'm looking at people who got a 50 versus people who got a 51 on the exam. You know, so these are like very similarly qualified individuals. Controlling for where they're from. Right, yeah, and controlling for where they're from. And so, so I guess, you know, I, I, you know, I wish I knew what their attitudes were before the test, um, and I don't have that. Um, but I think it is about the exam, and I think that's also sort of bolstered by some of the qualitative work that I've done in Indonesia, in which I've interviewed um, a lot of these folks that are applying for these jobs. Um, and hearing them describe, you know, the distinct sting of, uh, you know, failure and how how it's sort of shame inducing, you know, their families watching. What is, so, can I just say one? Of course. I wonder if one way to get around that is to look at regional world values surveys in places that some people have from. Like a benchmark. So, yeah, yeah, the benchmark to see if if these people turn out to be lower. Right. Um, then. Than what the average would be for the Yeah, region. yeah, definitely. This is a, like a reality you know, check to make that stronger. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right, Aaron and then Steve and then Marcel. Great. Thank you so much for, uh, for the talk there. I really enjoyed learning more about Indonesia. Um, so, a couple things. One, um, for a compliment, I think you keep speaking to the persistence effect. Um, and I think that'd be one way to sort of sell a lot of situators on the literature. Because, I mean, there, you know, there's you know, a figure of um, like people who Saying very complicated effects, but even more than we've done. Similar effects for our product policy. And then, uh, you made it about what your education is, which is sort of the implications of policy in the long run. I think by using that, you can get interesting findings that you know, we have this individual injury with the test, and clearly your effect is really for us to be aware of. I think that's a really good comment for our participants, and we can have to do a lot of project that way. Um, so, a second, so First, I want to link uh, a related literature on self confirmation. So, there are these findings in the psychology literature, and hundreds of publications, that if you give someone self affirmation in a certain area of their life, they might be sort of pro social and pro active effects in areas that are totally unrelated to where that affirmation takes place. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with failure, right? So, I'm wondering, so the, the real sort of take here from this is that we love this is a placebo test to show that these people. Can become negative about all sorts of different areas about their life, um, and this is really a specific response to politics and government on um, civil service exam, not just sort of you know you can question all sorts of various things that you can <coughs> challenge your social conference. Um, so you have some sort of random outcomes on the survey that you can sort of show that you think they're on awesome. so significant placebo effects in some of the areas that have been changed. Um, and then finally, I'm curious about whether you can tell us if there's any differential effect of quality of failure. So, like, you ask you know, the applicants to know how much they failed or succeeded by it. So, yeah, I can see a, you know, and you have a theory of how that might affect their, you know, the response, right? If you fail by one point, you might think, oh, this test is corrupt, et cetera. But if you fail by 20 points, you might be more like, yeah, it's definitely not me. I mean, is that, and, and yeah. if there is that differential effect, that can sort of, you know, the inhibitor changes the substance of the people. Study, right? I mean, if you only you know, observe this persistent effect with people who really fail at one or two points, then that's a small group that you might not have to worry about. Also, 
which meant maybe like the management system, um, where you know, it's the size of people, but there's that huge pool. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I, I too really enjoyed the talk and, and, I, and I really enjoyed what you're trying to do. Um, I guess I'm I'm more worried about I mean, the leap from um, sort of a constrained set of findings having to do with attitudinal shifts among those who just won and those who barely lost, right? To system wide policy recommendations, right? Because when you get into there, it seems to me there's a lot of compared to what problems here. For instance, a lot of you in this talk at least rests on your first claim that tests replicate inequality. Um, again, compared to what? In the United States, for instance, um, there's a lot of pushback now from educational researchers, Susan Minarski, all of her students at Michigan. And in fact, something like SAT scores is probably your best bet if you actually want to start changing the, the, the makeup of a lot of public institutions for the students because they're actually the least manipulable, right? What they're the less manipulable than you know, participation clubs, all the things, you know, going abroad, um, going to prep school, all this other stuff. Right. Um, and so for me, as I hear this stuff, um, and you said, you know, I would want to know what was the baseline of the other system, right? What inequalities were being replicated before you got to an exam system? And because that then matters in terms of, you know, the, the system wide policy recommendations you're going to make, um, because there, there might be much fewer of these perceptions about. Um, this is rigged, this is corrupt than before, right? Um, we just don't know because we don't have the baseline. Um, and for instance, even the, the, the graph on violence, right, protests about this, I could tell a story. So here, here's the question. So push back on, on my story, which is actually the people who are protesting were people who would have benefited from the prior system. And now they find themselves in a meritocratic system based on an exam result, and they don't get a job, right? It's the reduction of prior, uh, prior uh, preference that leads those who would have won before and now lose to uh, protest the exam. All right, Marcel. Um, I just wanted to make a general point about the. Uh, I, 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 I really enjoyed the results. I, I thought the interpretation of the findings was a little bit reduction. Um, I think that exams can and have been used to make many points on generation technology. This is a way of passing uh, your privileges to, to, to generations. It's what my very happy. It's what, and it, I'm surprised when I said that you talk about language. Frankly, the language, you know, this the national language, but it's not going to be in favor. It's, it's the language of them. So, so certain people in Papua, I don't think will be favored in having so, so, but these are examples of situations where the exam is not going to be corrupt, manipulated. The exam is what creates an inequality because people from different backgrounds will have different chances on this exam. And the uh, final point I wanted to make is so, this is an, an entry exam. As I remember, we were one, one year when I was in Oxford uh, doing admissions, I said, well, are we, are we predicting, you know, in this theory in terms of predicting success in the exams? And then they, they kind of go, actually, no, not that, not very much, actually. Not very much. But in a situation where you have your exam selection, you, you take on this exam as a predictor of performance. And it's probably a predictor compared to nothing. But is it the perfect predictor of performance? Probably not. And, and especially if you take a Japanese and send it to who are islands, you know, it's not going to be very reasonable local culture. So, so these are situations where actually the success on the meritocratic meritocratic exam may not actually be very very well. But that would be something you didn't want to question. Yeah. At least don't, don't, don't take that for granted. Yeah. Um great. Um so I'll, I'll start with Aaron, you're your comments. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
the, I mean, I, so the placebo test suggestion is a good one. Um, I'll need to look back at the survey. I'm not, I'm not confident that I asked any sort of placebo questions. I think, um, you know, one thing I do look at is, and this may or may not answer your, your question about the sort of self-affirmation thing is, you know, I do look at the uh, public sector wage premium, or not even the public sector wage premium, basically looking at incomes across those who passed and failed the basic comp test. And I find, you know, really a slight, uh, you know, a very slight difference on that particular outcome. So it's about 60,000 more rupiah per month for those that narrowly passed. Um, and so on balance, I take this to sort of mean that like individuals who fail that test are not going on to become depressed and like stay home and not work or whatever. I think it is sort of narrowly tailored to, to their sort of experience, their, their thoughts on the test itself. Um, and I, you know, I can see that's a very imperfect placebo test. The problem is I sort of tailored the survey in a way that was only going to gauge the questions that I, I was interested in. Um, and then, you know, about the, do people know how close they were to the failure and passage rate? So for the main test, they do. I mean, a screen pops up and it says you got a 254, threshold was 255, red screen, you fail. One thing that's interesting that I haven't looked at is that for the rule of three, individuals don't know how close they are to the failure and passage rates, right? Because that happens behind a, a sort of veil. Um, and I can, I, I have looked at attitudinal separation across those individuals and it, it does exist at that level too. But I, you know, I, I need to go back and look at those results. But in theory, that suggests that you can extrapolate away from the threshold. Um, so individuals who don't know how close they were to the exam score or the exam threshold still feel this frustration, for instance. Um, so Steve, and I, and I think also Marcel, I mean, I think I've been interpreted as very anti-test. Um, and I sort of, uh, I have had, you know, many personal failures on tests. So, you know, maybe I am anti-test. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm not anti-test. I want to make that clear. Um, you know, I, the point of this research is really to highlight that there are, I think, some subtle downsides to these things um, and that they shouldn't be swept under the rug. Um, but I agree, and then elsewhere in my research, I have tried to look at, you know, what was it like before? I mean, what was the baseline? And the baseline in Indonesia was clientelism and, and patronage, right? Um, and I think as I was mentioning to, to, to someone earlier, I mean, I think the comparison I'm trying to make isn't that there was not conflict before or that now there's less conflict, for instance. The, the thing that I'm trying to say in the broader project is that the axis of conflict has now shifted a little bit, right? And so previously you can, and I have a paper on this that I'd be happy to share with you. Um, I show that under patronage, there was a lot more intra-ethnic conflict. It took on a sort of class sort of grievance under patronage. It doesn't mean that there was less conflict. It just means that it was just a different form of conflict. Um, and it was within ethnic groups. But now with this system, what I've been trying to show is that the sort of conflict and the axis of Grievance, uh, grievance is, is, is shifted to become more interesting. Um, so, you know, you know, is that better, is that worse? I think given that there's probably these service delivery boosts that come from um, using uh, exams, I think you know, on balance, we probably should desire the system a little bit more, but I think, you know, tinkering with it in the way that, I, that Frank was proposing in terms of fixing, say these residency requirements is really the point that I'm, I'm trying to highlight. Um, and then Marcel, to your point, so, so I'm a little bit confused about the, the language issue. So I think in theory, like the, you know, I think Indonesian literacy rates are at like, you know, high 90s across the entire region, surely lower in, in Papua, but the Javanese, you know, the Indonesian national language isn't the Javanese first language. It's everyone's second language. So I think, um, you know, that's a, a bit different. And then your, your, your comment about exam scores being a predictor of performance, I mean, I think you're, you're sort of two steps ahead of me. This is sort of a, a follow-up project that I'm trying to do with this data um, is to sort of link up these exam scores to then, you know, personnel performance indicators to see the extent to which they are in fact um, predictive of these things. Uh, I think it would be very interesting if, as you suggest, they're not very predictive at all. Um, I think then, you know, back to Steve's question, it would be, I think, more interesting to consider the sort of broader normative. Kind of like, kind of like is this paper where he looks at, uh, uh, I think, Israeli army recruiters. Uh -huh. and they, they predict or they were sure this person could work with them. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, the exams themselves are not great 
I don't know if I should, is this a recorded session? They have um, <laughs> questions like, for instance, what is the uh, proper dimensions of the Indonesian flag? So it's 90 centimeters by 150 centimeters. Um, you know, is this the sort of stuff that's going to predict how well you can deliver services? I, I don't think so. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe that, that's part of the problem. Okay, so questions from Aitu and Carlos, and then we're going to try to have Don Emerson ask his question live. We have some questions from visiting scholar. I do. I can ask some questions because of the questions we ask. Uh, are you sure? Yeah. Oh, yeah Carlos? Oh, nice. Okay, well, that's too bad. Um, so, Don, this is going to be an attempt to unmute you. And, you know, this is all just a uh, experiment as well. So, Don, you'll have to unmute yourself. Hey, can you speak? Can you hear me? Are you, Don, can you? I'm ready. No, oh, he's like on my computer. Okay. I unmuted. Can you mute yours? <laughs> Even though it's allowing Don to be with us. So, am I okay? Can you try speaking again? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh. Can, can you hear me? This control is that. Okay. We can have him sort of ask on my computer because I'm sure he has a good question. Yeah. If, All right, Don, you want to go ahead and try? Okay. Can you hear me? I yeah. Can. Turn your I'll volume. Repeat, I'll repeat what you say. Okay, did I press oh, no. you? Don't turn your volume. <clears throat> Can you right, hear me? Tell me if you want me to go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay. Did I pass the exam? That's the question. Did I pass the exam? Okay. Can I, can I speak? Yes. All right, good. Okay. Um, I'm fantasizing as I'm listening to this fascinating conversation. And congratulations, Nick. You've got a terrific project and it's going to make a terrific book. But I'm thinking of the book. Professors tend to do that. And I can imagine a title of the book, something that might be way off target to the rather narrow schedule of you know, activities that you envisaged in doing this particular research. And right? looking at the, at the micro dramas of individuals who have just either barely succeeded or barely failed the exam, right? Uh, one could hardly think of something more micro in terms of the individual personalities of the people you know, sitting at the desk, okay? And the title I have in mind is Meritocracy Reconsidered, which is vast, maybe far too vast for the taste of many people in the room, myself perhaps even to some extent included. But if you get that far because your publisher says, we want this book to sell, then it seems to me that you're going to have to at least make some allowance for, if not comment upon, things like the a debate that one can imagine between Daniel Bell on the one hand, right, uh, in defense of a Chinese version of meritocracy, right, highly controversial. And then Ed Aspinall on the decline of democracy or the stagnation or even the regression of democracy in Indonesia, which is equally controversial, as I'm sure you know, among Indonesianists, right? Now that's all fascinating stuff, but it's pretty far removed <clears throat> from the very narrow focus, focus with which you began. That's my comment, and then a quick question. What was the reaction of your Indonesian colleagues who are actually in the civil service? How did your Indonesian colleagues react to your findings? <laughs> did I screw everything up? Please, he can okay. hear you. Okay, so Don can hear me. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll consider your your point about the uh, the book title. I um, and the you know book suggestion. Um, as I sort of move through this project, I think I'm not not yet at that point, but I I, I think it's good food for thought. Um, and then your question: How do the Indonesian colleagues respond? Um, well, that depends, I think, on who uh, to whom I was speaking at the time. So I think um, the Javanese interlocutors that I had sort of. Uh, did not respond as perhaps positively as some of the others. Um, I think when I spoke with folks, for instance, on the island of Lombok, they were very much uh, understanding of what it was that I was trying to get at. Uh, I think speaking to the interlocutors that I had that were at sort of a high level, at a policy level, um, they responded in the way that Pabima responded with that quote that I had at the beginning, which was sort of to say, 
yeah, this is something that that we're sort of trying to deal with. Um, but it's really, you know, it's it's sort of the cost of doing business because we care about these sort of reforms. Um, but I think, you know, on an individual level, it really depended on the sort of positionality of the individual uh, that I was speaking to. Does that does that answer your question, Don? It sounds like you had an, an expectation for how they might have responded. I don't know how to make oh, okay. it clear about it, but <laughs> right. Sorry. Sorry. we're going to response. not try that. But there's a final question from a visiting scholar, Mr. Kellen, who will be with us as of October, um, who asks, I think, a version of the question that's been asked, but it's about the generalizability of your theory. Uh, so you've shown that exam outcomes affect attitudes with these same factors like dignity, cost, and frustration change attitudes in a homogenous society? Um, and what is the variation in the out-group experience, um, you know, like between narrow Javanese winners versus narrow Javanese losers? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, and it's a good opportunity to make a plug, which is that I think this research design is sort of generally applicable and can work in many contexts. So if anyone has any leads and they'd like to work on it, please let me know. Um, I think, you know, I don't think, for instance, the in-group preferentialism findings would hold in a more homogenous case, say, um, I don't know, Scandinavia or some context in, in, in East Asia. Um, I think those findings are conditional on some level of group-based inequality that filters through the exam procedure. I think you know, more interesting is the possibility that other outcomes like national identification or, or perceptions of corruption still hold in those homogenous contexts. And my expectation would be that, that they probably would. Um, you know, if you fail this exam and you become frustrated with the, the government and the state apparatus, I think the idea that you might come to reflect negatively on the national identity that's sort of undergirding that state apparatus is probably pretty generalizable. Um, and it would be interesting, you know, it'd be very interesting to see. Unfortunately, uh, I have not yet had the opportunity, but I think Korea in particular has a strong exam based procedure in a fairly homogenous society. And so I think that's an obvious uh, next. Place to sort of test this theory to sort of get at some of the generalizability concerns you have. So perfect. Well, thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone, for being back. Thank you, Nick, for being our guinea pig as we like try yeah. to sort through all this technology. Um, it's really wonderful. And if you have any like comments on you know process or, or setup or something, we, we are accepting those comments. Um, but yeah, thank you. Welcome back and congratulations, Nick. <laughs> Humor for for being.